Hi, I'm Chris Corvain, staff writer at The Pit, and uh, I'm talking to Rex Brown of Pantera about the 20th anniversary repressing of Reinventing the Steel. Rex, thank you so much for joining us today. How are y'all? How you doing? How's everyone out there? Hopefully good. Staying inside. Now, now I'm finding you at, at home in, did you say New Mexico today? I'm in my house in New Mexico. I, I've been here since quarantine, so I bounced back and forth between Texas and, uh, and Nashville, where I've been recording for the last five years. First of all, man, let me just say congratulations on, you know, the 20th anniversary of this awesome album, this vinyl repressing of it. Um, it's very cool. I'm super excited about it. Um, I was, as a kid, Reinventing the Steel was the first Pantera album that, like, came out when I was a Pantera fan. So getting to yeah. re-listen to it and whatnot has been really exciting. So You like the new mixes or did you, uh, did you butt them up or... I like them all right, man, but I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, man. I'm, I just, I'm, I'm a sucker for like an album when I first heard it and everything. I mean, I am too, you know, but at the same time, I think the way this came about was that uh, they wanted a remix of the record. Since Terry wasn't the producer for this record, I really wanted him involved in some sort. Um, Terry Date, it, it took us a while to do that because he had other commitments and uh, he was doing the new Deftones record, which is fucking awesome i've only heard a couple of tracks i don't mean to go through the whole thing but um i think stefan finally found that great, awesome awesome tone so man the, the first thing i want to ask you dude was uh uh in terms of reinventing the steel when you when you think back on that record and sort of that time in pantera's history like what's your gut memory like what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about it? after a great sudden trend kill we had offers that just wouldn't stop coming, you know. We had uh, we had we had toured that for, and we would tour for fifteen to sixteen months on each individual record. About that point, we were all kind of needing a break. I went for like, um, uh, I think we had like three or four months off, the most time that we had had up to that point. Um, and I went and did uh, Jerry Cantrell's uh, first solo record. We had also put out a live record in between that to kind of tied the fans over because the touring was coming in really the, you know, when offers come in, you just, we wanted to get out of that, just make a record, get, get on the road, make a record, get on the road. You know, that it, it really starts to fuck with you. We had toured for like three years and then I think we started this project and at least kind of getting the songs together. Philip came down. Uh, you know, what I remember the most about this record is that um, we wanted to get, you know, like, I think one of the things that Philip said, he wanted to make it more, um, more anthemic, you know, um, if that's the word, more anthems, you know, the more, the, that's kind of the Pantera thing. So we, we kind of like just wrote, wrote, everybody made a list of what, you know, our top five, we wanted to go back and take that, you know, that, it, it was kind of funny the way we did it, but you know, what, what are your top favorite parts about what Pantera was? Cause you know, it had been a while since we had put out say the Vulgars and the far beyonds. And, and then we went really crazy with that, with the, uh, you know, great Southern. So by the way, kids, I'm out here in the snow. We just got our first snow yesterday, two, two, uh, two big feet of it. So anyway, um, it, it was one of those things where we wanted to make the, you know, quintessential um, kind of Pantera record of where we were at the time, um, but be a lot more, um, instead of just going off the cuff with the riffs, really, this this was a well more thought out record than the previous record before it. And, and, and the way we always judged it was that um, we would do a record and we'd go tour, tour it for 16 months then you didn't want to go back and listen to that record because you just played those songs, you know, 350, 60 times, you know what I'm saying? So um, every record you just, you know, you would have to, you'd have to listen to it over and over and over and over and over and over and you don't go back and listen to them very much. And uh, so this one was, this one's kind of hard, was kind of hard for me to go back and listen to because it was our last one, uh, dying, being killed and, you know, um murdered and uh and all that so you know it was it was tough for me to go back and listen to that record because it, it was one of my favorites for sure something uh uh you brought up just now about uh phil kind of coming in and wanting it to be more anthemic um you know something i i definitely think about with uh reinventing the steel is how it's kind of the record that 
that perfectly sits in the middle between kind of extreme metal Pantera, like the Great Southern Trend Kills, almost like like uh, thrash and death metal influences, and like old school Cowboys from Hell, kind of steely traditional heavy metal Pantera. And I was wondering, um, you know, going into this, did you feel that there was any sort of pressure from anyone around you to sort of do one or the other, to either go crazier or go more traditional? That that was all a group consensus. And and for one thing, we never had any A&R people, anybody from a label, you know, uh, pushing it down our throats, except for, you know, they always wanted product so they could sell it, you know. Um, and we just, we, you know, flat out sometimes we just tell them to fuck off, you know, and that, that's just the way we were as people, as a band, you know, um, you know, there was no pressure at all. The pressure we always put was on ourselves to make the best thing that we could, you know, at that certain time and, and the different elements that we had to, that we had to go through to get to the final point, you know, which, which this one was really easy to do. That's interesting, man, because, uh, you know, it's, it's a record that also, um, I feel like re-listening to it, it feels like a record where you all feel like you're you're really uh, kind of showing off all your capabilities. You talked about bringing all the old songs together. It feels like a record where Dimebag is going hard on his on his like cool groovy riffs, and Phil is having a lot of fun. That was just the idea. Then when the when the riffs started coming out, you know, it was this new kind of monster. You know, we always had this chemistry in the studio that no matter where we were if we we hardly ever stumbled where we would stop and go oh no you know we would always work out a part to make sure the song was getting what it needed then we'd come back and listen to it and then maybe add different things to it but um i remember this record as being a a, it was more all of us in the room because philip was there had flown down to dimes and and uh it was really um it took all of us you know so man, that's that's interesting talking about the the riffs coming out. Something I wanted to ask you about this album, man, was you know obviously it is it is as you said earlier, in almost a bittersweet way, it's the last Pantera album. Is there a moment like a, a riff or a moment on the album's playing, um, specifically on Dimebag's playing, where you listen to it and it it really gets you, or it's it's something where you're like, I remember when this got written and it was incredible. I mean that that whole the the whole thing went down so so quickly. I mean, any time that cat played, man, it, it was uh, or any of us got in the same room together, it, it was always a thrill, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's tons of parts where you know we were going, we we would we would sit and build the song in the studio. It's Pantera. It's what it is. You know, it, it, we get in a room and, and the sounds will start flying. We would write a song, uh, get it the best that we could, and then we start layering, you know, and it went that quick. And uh, some of the sound that we were kind of playing with uh, were just staples of what we've been using live, you know. Basically, took all of our live setup, put it in the studio, and just started bouncing ideas off each other. Now, that's really interesting, man. Did you feel like that was a that was a, a thank you a big shift and a more uh, did that feel better in terms of that than you know sort of recording separately or kind of it was being in the room really? Do you feel like that captures what Pantera is like four dudes? We, we always the, the three of us always recorded four on the floor. That's what I call you know um, uh, getting the basic tracks for Vinny, and then from there we would um, either you keep you know you keep the um, if the bass is good enough through the whole track that you did, we would we would go. Can you make can you make that any better than what you did? Sometimes, like if songs like uh, um, floods off of uh, like the uh, you know from like a bass part or something like that. I can just speak for myself on this. Floods was just I, I went just directly with Vinny when we were recording the stuff, um, and that was off uh, uh, Trend Kill, and so. With this record, I can't remember, you know, exactly. Um, I can remember that, but I can't remember the. I don't. There certainly a lot of that stuff is live, and just go back and punch you. We we weren't, you know, we had played together since we were 15 years old. You know, um, we we didn't miss notes, you know, intentionally. If we did, we just go punch that one in. But um, a lot of the time, a lot of this stuff was just on the ground, you know that uh that feeling of you know now philip wouldn't and philip would always sing after you know mm-hmm. we knew where the parts were and where everything else were 
it's interesting, like walking into the studio for this record, like one of the things, so, so as a Pantera fan, you know, there's off, often like this myth of like the Pantera, like the party ethos and the, the constant good time and the craziness of being this constantly touring band. And I was wondering with Reinventing the Steel, you know, with a couple of albums under your belt, was that still going strong or were you guys kind of like, you know what, for this one, we're going to, we're going to sit down and focus, take it easy. I think, I think this one's more, well, more focused than, I mean, the, it's not saying that the others weren't focused. I think that, that uh, I think with this one, we had uh, being on the road that long, man, we were kind of burnt anyway from the drinking and, and everybody would come on and kind of sober up for a while. And especially for this, we didn't, you know, we would probably start working one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, and the drinks wouldn't fly till late at night. You know that that was usually the 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 program in the studio because you you had to be on. You know you didn't want to waste anybody's time. You know, um, and nobody was. And I remember the whole session. Nobody was out of hand. You know. Yeah, th this was a very more focused. Um, you know what we want to do, and not not till later to you know when the lyrics come over. You know what Phillips doing and everything else. I think we we laid all the bed tracks first, and then, you know, Philip and Philip and uh, Philip and Dime worked really hard with the lyrics on this one more than they probably since probably since you know like the Cowboy days, you know, Dime worked a lot with Philip on the first you know couple of records and let him go for a couple of records, and this one they came back to that uh, that bond because they were staying in the same house, you know, and they're bouncing ideas off each other. You know, when I talked about the sort of different sides of like the extreme music and the and the traditional heavy metal, like like Philip and Dime are those two sides in my in my estimation. But it's interesting to hear that at the same time they were always, you know, they were working so well together and kind of, you know, had this well, inherent bond. You know, we had gone through a lot of stuff with Phil and the back problems and all that kind of stuff and didn't know what we were, we were gonna get when he got there. And when he did, it was um it really put a, it really sparked, a, um, lit a fire up our ass, you know, it's like, okay, good. Now we can, this is back to the old days, you know? And I think that's, that's what kind of the whole vibe just kind of took that cohesion and, and worked to our favor. It's cool, man. That's cool. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting too, to hear about that because obviously like, uh, uh, as a record, it's a record where I feel like both Phil and Dime are, are, at their, you know, at their, the height of their sort of talent and their perseverance, you know what I mean, man? Um, you know, it sounds, it's a record where the lyrics and the guitar are very much like, you know, ruling this album. I think, yeah, they kind of, now you think about it, I never noticed that before. Um, well, maybe just because I'm in the band, um, they did kind of play off each other, you know, the riff and then the vocal and the riff and the vocal and, you know, that's how we did it. I, I, know, I was never that involved with the lyric point you never know what phil was going to do i just you know me and benny had to keep that pocket really deep and tight and you know for those two guys to go off on and that's that's what makes a band without without that rhythm section underneath it buddy you ain't got you don't have anything to lay anything down on you know what i mean is there a track on that uh on reinventing the steel man where you're like if you only knew how hard Vinny and i worked to keep that keep that tight and lock that down um no, because the dude, like I said before, it's so instilled in you. You know, you you've mm -hmm. been playing with these guys, these guys for twenty years now. You know, um, we um, no going back twenty years later and trying to think of an individual time. Hell no, nobody could do that. <laughs> um, but you know, like again, that's just honest. We were, you know, I knew them by like the back of my hand. I knew what was going to happen next. I mean, it, it, we just all, we were that tight of a unit, you know, I don't know if you ever saw us live or you ever, you were of age to know any of that, but, um, man, that, that's, uh, just something you're born with it, you know? Um, and, and you put those four different characters into a band together and then that's, that's what you have, you know? So it did very solid unit. I mean, you're working with a lot of talent there, you know, and that's why we wanted to do this record on our own. You know, Vinny, Vinny is always, was always a great, great engineer in the studio. You know, what was it about Vinny Paul that, you know, I feel like Vinny Paul's rhythms. And as you're saying, like, like keeping these tracks tight, were very much part of what made Pantera so vital. And, um, you know, I want to ask you as, as a dude who, 
spend so much time with that guy. Like, what was it about Vinnie Paul's playing and about Vinnie Paul as a dude that that really made Pantera's drums sort of what they were? Oh, I mean, good God, man. Um, state the obvious. Um, his, his meter, I mean, just everything that he did was just rock solid. You know, he, he had an uncanny way of when the song was trying to fly, you know, where, where the adrenaline's really pumped up and we're playing. He would try to just, he would sometimes lay back a little bit instead of going for it, you know? So, so he would keep that pocket just right where it needed to be. Let the song get the energy that it needs, but don't go, you know, you, you're going to find that on any of those tracks on the, that record, they start at one point on a metronome and they're, they're not, but maybe a cunt hair fucking off at the very end of the song. But the excitement in between that, you know, of all the breaks and changes, that's what makes uh, those the re that record especially, but you know, dangerous. That's interesting, man. Because now that I think about it, it you know, Vinnie Paul, something that really interested me and excited me about his playing was that it wasn't just a barrage of of beats or or similarly a need to stay tight, like perfect on every single track, you know. For, you know, for us, it was all about the song. It, you know, what does a song need? Does it need to, you know, that, that, that was all built in, you know, at that point. It, there's no, no, no need to microscope. Oh, you know, what do we need to do there? This one was just pure energy from the get-go. And um, as soon as we had the sounds up and everything else, you know, I had, uh, I really kind of pushed Vinny this time to not use, I wanted to use smaller toms. You know, maybe a little bit, a little bit of a, uh, a smaller kill where you get a bigger thing in the mix, um, and it's unusual how much, how, how good that those really sounded. You know, and I think that it gave everything else a little bit more room to breathe because those drums that he had were, you know, gigantic toms, and he went, you know, to more to the regular standard kind of toms, and that's the only thing that we really changed. Um, as far as gear wise, but, um, um, man, I, you know, I miss that camaraderie really bad. You know, I, I have since, um, you know, it's been a long while and, uh, we all go through it, but, uh, you have your good days and you're bad and, and, uh, you get on, but I miss those brothers badly. So it's kind of hard to, t so it's kind of hard to talk about you. You understand that, right? Sure, sure. No, I, I was going to say, man, uh, you know, for the record, man, I, I am terribly <laughs> sorry, man, you know, obviously. No, no, no. I'm not looking for that. I'm not sure. looking for the pat on the back. I'm just saying, you know, look, here, here's the deal. Both those guys are not no longer with us. The thing is, the music still holds up. Next question. Damn straight. Reinventing the Steel, obviously the last Pantera album, um, ends with a song called, uh, you know, I'll Cast a Shadow. And to me, it feels it feels prophetic in a way. And something I was wondering, man, was, you know, when, when the album that ended... That wasn't planned out. Okay, it was, it was not planned out. So let's don't get too, too uh, picky, picky, picky with the last Pantera record, because we had planned on, you know, we needed a break away from each other for a while, you know. And after we had toured that for another six, you know, sixteen months with that record, we come to that point where we needed a break, and then all hell broke loose, and then you know there it was, um, and it was over. And so we always, you know, put, put into the equation that you're only as good as the last thing that you do, you know, so you, you better make sure that all that stuff you just did in the studio that night was tight because we, when you had that 45 minute drive home, anything could fucking happen to you, you know, um, you could get hit by a truck, some drunk driver, whatever the fuck it was. Um, and this just so happened to be the last record that we did. Um, I wish that what happened to Dime wouldn't have, of course we all do. Um, then you'd have plenty more music and you wouldn't be so skeptical about this one, you know, but I understand. Something else you, you just brought it up, man, is I, I remember the, the one time I got to see Pantera live, man, was on your tour with Slayer, uh, Static X, Morbid Angel after this, man. Um, and that, that show 
blew me away. And I remember that tour being just massive and exciting, man. And so with Reinventing the Steel, you know, uh, uh, the tours you guys went on with these huge bands, these bands like metal bands like Slayer, like, uh, uh, what was that touring cycle like, man? What was it like getting these songs out in front of people? Just another day at the office, man, you know? <laughs> get up and do your show and you've got a whole catalog of fucking great songs but it, it's just work man you know and, and meeting the fans and and uh you know turning people on that was our whole fucking deal in the first place you know it wasn't money it wasn't about money and fame and all that kind of bullshit it was about turning you know, number one turning ourselves on to the music and then and then making sure that uh you know the other people could dig it too that, that's what it was about so it just you know Touring, the, the 22 hours of the day are the, are the fucking most bullshit part of anything. It's those two hours of the day that make all the difference in the world. I wish I had this glamorous story for you, man, that, you know, <laughs> fucking Elvis came down and, you know, you know, flame shot out of his ass and all that kind of stuff. It was just another day at the rodeo, man. And it was a fucking, another day at the rodeo was like leading 10 men's lives for, 20 years there you go you know for me man another day at the office with slayer involved like hanging out with slayer seems like a pretty cool day at the office man so so kudos we had a good time with those boys they were always uh you know number one to go on after slayer was the the one thing that we dreaded most from you know maybe day one when philip got in the band you know you don't want to follow those cats and um but I think uh, I think we handle it very well. No, I mean they they were a, a, a great live band though. You guys, you know, seeing you guys on that tour definitely you you held up and you held your own in a way a lot of bands couldn't. You know, man. It was all about the song. In that respect, man, you know, just touring nonstop with those guys was there. You know, was there something that you guys uh, did or specifically tried to work with whenever you were touring to like stay sane or not get burnt out on the road? Was there any way to keep that from setting in? No, because Dom always had, he was up to pranks. And um, every day, you know, um, the home video four hadn't come, hadn't come out, but I've seen a lot of footage of it. And it was just always, man, it was just always, he would just, he would make your whole day enjoyable, regardless, you know? And the days they weren't, we were kind of like, oh, thank God, you know, we get a break. For a minute but he was man he, that fucker he was so creative that he would just come up with stuff out of the fucking blue didn't matter if you were just sicker than a dog you know had a how viral whatever um he that dude would make you you know you would have to do a shot and uh regardless if you were on medication or not you know like um <laughs> it, it would just uh he used to say the the booze was the uh was the healer back in those back on that tour absolutely that's crazy man was there ever a moment where you just you uh, it sounds like it's it was the kind of pranks where you're never like god damn it that son of a bitch you always came away being like you gotta laugh you know it's something like this you you had it, see it's, it's the only way that you can pass your time during the day you have to come with a good attitude and you know we were we were on top of the world at that point um we had toured an awful lot, you know, extreme amounts of uh, torture on the body. And every day was a good day. You know, you, you had to make it the best that it could possibly be. Talking about this this new uh, repressing and this vinyl repressing of reinventing the steel man, um, you know, uh, having Terry Date involved, you know, something I think is interesting is Terry Date said he didn't want to mess too much with the production because he loved the, the sound of the original album. And, uh, you know, I was just wondering what you think Terry brings to the table each time, sort of what he, he did here that was, you know, gave it his own sort of uh, take on this record. You know, I really liked the sound of the first record, but when, I, when we started hearing these tapes and it was me and Philip um, emails every day, you know, for probably two months solid um, about what we liked and what we didn't as soon as they would come in. And... Um, it started to take on a different, a different, um, you know, towards the end, once we had the, you know, like the basics of everything that were down, Sterling, Sterling Winfield mixed that record basically back the original. And so, which is 
an awesome, awesome mix. And, um, you know, with, with the boys helping. Um, but with Terry, it was, you know, it was like um, that's the end of the game. And I wanted him to be a part of it, you know. Um, and I think he put an extra spin onto it that maybe, you know, people that weren't, that didn't have that record or people that are just being turned on to Pantera can listen to it now in a different light and hear all kinds of stuff. It just, I always like remixes of stuff that are you know, kind of, uh, it's just a different tape, but we didn't change anything on it, you know? Um, you know, with this box that that's all kind of, of, of kind of unreleased stuff that, that didn't come out. Um, some of the bonus tracks and stuff like that, that Terry did not mix. Um, but it was, um, you know, this whole undertaking, it, because of this pandemic, you know, we were going to put all the vinyl releases and all the CDs together at the same time. Then we couldn't find anybody in the States that were open or had any vinyl to print it on. So uh, the vinyl won't come out until January the 8th, I believe, something like that, which isn't too far away. But it sounds so good on vinyl. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. With Terry being involved, it, it was um, it was more sonically he's done his part he's done what he needed to do and it um uh, it kept us all kind of ex very excited you know to get the mixes and and hear that record especially one that i hadn't gone back until much later after dime got shot um you know to 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 kind of go back and just listen how awesome that record was that's cool, man. I'm, I was wondering, are you yourself, man, a, a vinyl collector? And is, the, in, is there something about Pantera on vinyl that you find special that gives it something special? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I don't listen to my own shit, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm a big vinyl, vinyl collector, you know. Um, I just got this new Tom Petty box set, and it's fucking insane. Yeah, I, man, I, 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 you name a record, I probably got it. Something that came to mind while re-listening to this record, man, is that, uh, you know, a lot, when this came out, there were a lot of these sort of new metal bands who weren't, you know, associated with traditional metal, but loved Pantera. And, um, you know, there are a lot of bands right now coming out who have a similar sound and a similar sort of heaviness that they really attribute to Pantera. And I think for a lot of them, this was a record that came out, you know, while they were absorbing new music and, and really meant a lot to them. And, and I was wondering, man, uh, when you hear metal bands where there's Pantera as an influence and there's reinventing the steel as an influence, um, you know, is it, is it, is it cool for you? Is it an honor? Is it something that you find yourself sort of noticing parts where you're like, ah, oh, that you, you obviously heard us before you wrote that riff. Uh, I'll just put it this way. It's very flattering. Um, I'll just leave it like that. Yeah. They, 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 there was a lot going on around that time and all these bands trying to find their own identity. And then all of a sudden there was no Pantera. And then there you go. So I'm very flattered, you know, that we, we made a mark and, and by God, you know, it's still, still kicking ass today. It's, it's cool, man. I'm excited for people to hear this, this record once more. I'm excited for new people to hear the record. And I guess the, the final thing I want to ask you, man, is, you know, if somebody is, has just gotten this repressing of the album, um, they're sitting down listening to it. Maybe they're a, they're a young fan who's never heard this album before. Um, What's something you're excited for them to hear and what's something you, you want to tell them before they listen to it? Just smoke a big fat joint and uh, <laughs> put, it, put your headphones on loud, as loud as it'll go, and listen to the whole piece of work. You know, um, these days everybody puts, uh, they have a Spotify list and they only listen to three songs off a record where artists are actually making records still you know, um, to this day. And that's what I like to, uh, we need to listen to this record all the way through. It doesn't make any sense. That's how we made the record. Well, dude, uh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate us getting a chance to chat about this record today, man. It meant a lot to me. So um, thank you for doing this. Thank you. It is kind of hard going back 20 years and that being your swan song and, you know, kind of talking about it um, in a way where, you know, two of the guys that aren't here anymore, you know, and you try to give as much respect as you can towards that. At the same time, you're trying to put across it. It's the music, not the hoopla that makes these kind of records. You know, it's, it's an artistry. It's not a, 
Oh, well, they, here's the, you know, there's a lot of work going into that record. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, we'll see y'all soon.